Back in World War II, an estimated 15 million soldiers and another 45 million civilians lost their lives during that time. But did you know another estimated 25 million were wounded? And many of whom would never fully recover from the wounds that they were uh, suffered in battle. Many years ago, I, I had the pleasure of getting to know a man who was wounded in a battle during World War II. He was a, a kind, gentle man that I met while working at the gentry shop. Uh, he was injured in a very famous battle, a battle known as the Battle of the Bulge. He had spent a couple of months there in a foxhole outside the city of Bastogne, Belgium. He survived heavy shelling by the Germans and did this while in sub-freezing temperatures. He lost many of his friends during those 43 days between December 16th, 1944 and January the 28th, 1945. Though he was a, a really nice man, I always sensed there was something not quite right about him. There was something that he, he was carrying a wound with him. I didn't know what it was. One day his wife pulled me aside and she shared with me why. She told me about his time in the war, specifically his time in this battle. She told me that even 40 years later at that time, many nights he would wake up with some horrendous nightmares. That though his body had healed from the wounds that he had gotten in battle, his mind and his memories had not. In my 65 years of life, I've come to realize that physical wounds often heal long before emotional wounds heal and mental wounds. It's not only true with soldiers, but it's true with everyone who's been wounded in this sinful, vicious world that we live in. And today, I want us to talk about healing. We're going to do this by looking at a man that Jesus healed at a pool of water near Jerusalem. Interestingly enough, we are not told his name. And maybe this is good, because possibly that will help us see ourselves in this story as this man. Maybe we are a person today that needs healing. This may be true that you might need physical healing, but I think probably many more of us today have wounds of other kinds. We're suffering from emotional wounds that we carry scars with us from past episodes in our lives. Others carry uh, wounds in their minds and in the way they think. Regardless, regardless of what your wounds are today, though, I want to let you know something, that Jesus still heals. Let's start in our passage, John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now, the pool of Bethesda has been excavated today. We've uncovered it. And yes, guess what? We've discovered that there were five porches there around the pool. Or porches, think of overhangs. Overhangs that provided shade where people could lay under those underhangs around the pool and stay in the shade. And we're going to see later why they were laying there. They were waiting for that water to stir. Look at verse 3. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at certain times into the pool and stirred up the water. And then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water was they were made well of whatever disease he had. Now, in the latter part of verse 3 and verse 4, John is probably here describing the folklore that had developed around the pool of Bethesda. He's trying to help his readers, many who would read this many, many years after the fact, to try to help them understand why there were so many sick people here. Why were there so many lame people laying around this pool? Maybe... There had been some healing by this pool. Maybe God had honored the faith of a few people who were looking to him for healing, and so he had done so. You know, God sometimes honors faith, even when it's misguided faith. 
But regardless, it's apparent that by the number of people that are gathered there, that there were healings that took place. I believe John is intentionally sharing with us the superstitious nature of the people concerning the pool because he wants us to to understand what superstition does. It motivates, but often it leads us down the wrong paths. Because, see, I don't think the healing that is described here in any way really fits the nature of God. I mean, think about it. Would a loving God who cares so deeply about widows and orphans and the poor and the helpless and the needy, would he set up a system that rewarded the strongest and the most connected and the most powerful? Because that's what this did. You had to be the first one there. You had to be the first one in the pool. (laughs) Can you picture in your mind when that water stirred, maybe by the bubbling up of a spring or by the wind, and and, and all these people, ah, you know, diving into this water? Well, that's what was happening. It, it, it seems more in line to me with the nature of God that God would work the way Jesus does here. He helps the weakest and he helps the helpless. You know, superstition is a very, very powerful motivator for people. I think this is why we need to be certain that what we believe and what we got our lives by are found in the pages of scripture, not in superstitions that have been passed down from generation to generation. If you've ever been to a place like Haiti, boy, you see the power that superstition holds over people and how it keeps them in fear and it keeps them in misguided beliefs that keep them almost imprisoned to something that's really not true. Guys, trust your Bible. If you've got those traditions and superstitions that have, you know, carried down through your family, you need to dismiss them. You need to hold on to what your Bible says. Look at verse 5. Now, there was a certain man there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Now, we don't know exactly how old this man is, but we do know that for the past 38 years, he has experienced this disability that has kept him around this pool. Whatever the root problem that caused him to be paralyzed, again, we don't know. But later, Jesus will indicate that maybe that problem that he had that caused him to be paralyzed was because of something that he had done in his previous life or earlier in his life. But for whatever reason, Jesus locks in on this man. Now, I wonder why this guy. What was it about him? We we don't really know. Maybe it was the length of time that he had been there, and Jesus just looked at him and thought, oh, man, this guy's been here too long. Maybe it was Jesus sensing in him a measure of genuine faith that he was looking to the Lord. But we we really don't know why. But for some reason, Jesus picked this guy. Maybe this is just an example of God's amazing, undeserved grace. That he was the least worthy person there. But isn't that the person that God often picks to heal? The person who is undeserving. Who is what we would consider the least that he picks to save and to heal and to bless. See, so many times you and I, we mistakenly think that, I got to do something great for God in order for God to bless me. I've got to show some sort of extraordinary faith and trust and it's up to me. You know, quite the opposite is true. We need to recognize, guys, we're never going to be worthy of God's mercy and God's grace. It is just that. It's his grace. And for some reason, from time to time, he looks down into our lives and he says, I'm going to bless you today in this way. And that's what he does for this man. Have you ever wondered, though, why Jesus didn't heal everybody at the pool that day? You ever thought about it? He could have said, hey, you know, he could have waved his arms and everybody jumps up and they have a big party breakout right there at the pool of Bethesda. He could have done that, but he didn't. We know that he healed a lot of people. We read about many people in the scripture that were healed, but he didn't heal everybody. 
Matter of fact, he didn't heal lots of people. At times, his healing appears random almost. At other times, it seems to be a response to someone's faith. Like the woman who was healed when she touched the hem of his garment. At times, it seems that Jesus healed because of the faith of the friends of the guy who's sick. You remember the story of the guys who let the guy down through the ceiling and Jesus healed him. Why? Because he saw the great faith of his friends. But I want you to remember this. Jesus is the Messiah who came to save people. He's not just a great guy with a healing ministry. And yet I think sometimes we want to turn Jesus into that guy. Jesus, first and foremost, is the Savior. What he wants to do in our lives, most importantly, is to forgive us and to save us. The greatest desire that he has for our lives is that we find eternal life in a home in heaven. Other blessings that he gives us along the way, well, they're just that. Wonderful, often unexpected blessings. And sometimes it includes healing. What is fascinating to me, though, is the question that Jesus asked this man. He said, do you want to be made well? Now, for many years, I read this story and I thought, Jesus, you got to be kidding me. That makes no sense whatsoever. Everybody wants to be healed. Do they? You know, the longer I've been a pastor, the more I've realized that everybody doesn't want to be healed. For healing comes at a cost. Think about this man for a moment. He hadn't taken care of himself in 38 years. All that time, he had needed the help of other people to eat and to survive. He couldn't work. At best, he begged. He depended on others for food. He depended on others for getting around. His very existence depended on the graciousness of the people around him. So what would happen if he were healed? What, what would it mean if he were suddenly able to walk again? to work again, to take care of his family again, to suddenly become responsible for himself without the assistance of other people. See, once healed, people would no longer feel sorry for him. Their attitudes would quickly change. Everyone would start looking at him differently. He would no longer be the helpless guy or the paralyzed guy. Now suddenly he's the miracle man. He, he doesn't even know where to begin when you have that type of healing. How does a person go from needing others for almost every necessity in their life to being totally responsible for himself? Guys, the cost of being healed is being responsible. Being healed means no more handouts. It means no more people feeling sorry for you. Suddenly, Life changes. Life, at the same time, gets both easier, but it also gets much more difficult. The cost of being made well is the responsibility that instantly returns to your life. When healed for the first time in many years, you're going to find yourself free from the bondage that you were in, free from the illness that you were suffering with. That's what he wanted for so long. But then you would quickly realize that with that freedom comes a lot of unexpected responsibility. Responsibility that we may have not felt for years. But suddenly, we experience a different kind of pressure in our lives. The pressure that comes, to, that comes from having to do what other people had been doing for us. Freedom and responsibility, they're an interesting thing because they're always coupled together. Have you realized that? You can't have one without the other. And this is an important truth about life. If I want freedom, in other words, in this case, to be healed or to be set free from an addiction, I have to assume the responsibility that comes with that freedom. 
I've been set free. And this is difficult. This is not as easy as it sounds. See, for many people, it's easier just to keep yourself in a place of dependence on other people for certain needs in your life. They can be emotional needs. They can be physical needs. But it's easy to kind of stay there and say, you know, I'm I'm comfortable with this. But you need to remember, with that dependency on other people, there comes a loss of freedom. It works this way. If I take from another person, I'm giving to them the right to speak into my life. In other words, by making yourself dependent on another person, I'm giving them the right to speak into the decisions that I make. I'm in some way turning part of the autonomy of my life over to that person. (laughs) This is the lesson that every parent needs to teach their child, their children. That if that child wants freedom, they've got to be willing to handle the responsibility that comes with that freedom. See, here's how it works. I always understood, as long as I was living under my parents' roof, that they were going to have a right to speak into my life and into the choices that I made. They could mandate things like that I would go to school or that I would get a job, which they did. I'll never forget the day my senior year of high school, that wrestling season ended, my dad walked into my room and said, James, go find a job. Now, I had never worked because I'd always been involved in sports and football and wrestling and other things in high school. But the day it ended, he showed up at my room to let me know life was changing. They even gave me a curfew. I commuted to and from college. And even when I was in college, I was not free to come home when I wanted to come home. They made it clear. Weekdays, you come home at 11. Weekends, 12. And they enforced it. I always thought I was a little old for that when I was 22 years old. They didn't. But you know what my dad made clear? This is, this is what he made clear. James, if you want more freedom, you can provide your own housing. You can pay your own rent. You can buy your own food. That's fine with me. Do whatever you want to do. See, the cost of them providing food and housing was that I had to live by their rules. I had to give up something. There's always a choice. How much freedom do I want? Well, how much responsibility am I willing to take? For this man, healing meant freedom. Suddenly he could walk where he wanted to walk. He could work where he wanted to work. He could go back to being a husband and a father. The cost of freedom, though, was going to be the heavy responsibility that came along with all those changes in his life. And so Jesus asked him the question, do you want to be made well? Now, there's a lot more behind that question than we think, isn't there? I mean, think about it. Our weaknesses and our infirmities and, and, and even the, the hurts that we have in our lives, sometimes they become like a, a comforting blanket to us. You ever seen a little child with a, with a little blanket that they won't let go of? Maybe you've had one. That blanket can be nasty and dirty. It can be soaked with saliva. It can stink. It can be stained with all kind of awful stuff. But that child is somehow comforted by it, and he ain't going to let go of it. He'll hang on to it tenaciously. And if you try to take it away from him, Well, you're going to find out just how important that blanket is to him. Now, when I was a child, I didn't have a blanket. You know what I had? I had a collection of teddy bears. Teddy bears. Lamb chops was one of them. Rough, rough. That's the only two I could remember. I was thinking about it this week. But at one time, I had 15 to 20 teddy bears that I would line up around my little twin bed, and and it was pretty crowded. From time to time, my mom tried to thin the herd you know, but I held on them to, to them tenaciously until one afternoon when our house caught fire. I was 11 years old. Lightning struck our house. It came in through the wiring and blew up the TV. Uh, fortunately, nobody was at home at the time, but 
Smoke and fire destroyed everything, including my teddy bears. And funny thing, I lost just about everything I owned that day. I mean, I'm talking everything. There was nothing left. I lost everything. But you know the only thing I cared about? The only thing I cried about was those stupid, stinking teddy bears. I remember sitting on the front porch of what was left of our house, asking my mom, come on, mom, we can get those teddy bears back. Come on. Nah, son, they're gone. I don't think they were burned up. I think they were just smoked, and and she was trying to get rid of them, so it was a good time. (laughs) It ended my life with stuffed animals, but it might have been the best thing that ever happened to me. Here's why. I was getting too old for those teddy bears. I was fixing to be laughed at if my friends would have come to the house. I needed to move on from them, but I didn't want to let go. And so God sent a spring thunderstorm, and he took care of it for me. I had no choice. Suddenly, I had to let go of the childish things that I was depending on. I had to grow up. Has God ever forced you to get past a childish behavior? Has God ever forced you to let go of something that you held on tenaciously, but you didn't need Has he ever made it clear that there was something in your life that it was just time to let go of? But you gripped it tenaciously. You held on to it. Guys, understand, becoming an adult is not easy. The responsibility of adulthood is a heavy burden to carry at times. But we've got to be willing to shoulder that load if we're going to mature in our walk with God. If we're going to get up from being little kids... And start being adults. So has Jesus ever asked you the question, do you want to be made well? Have you ever considered the cost of that healing? Let's look at how the lame man answers Jesus when he asks that question. Verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Now, he didn't really answer the question, did he? No, his attention is is so focused on what he saw as the, excuse me, the only solution to being healed. That's what he's focused on. He's got to get in that water, and he's got to be first. His healing was tied to that pool, and getting in that pool had become impossible for him. See, his pathway, what he saw God could do was very narrow. It was that pool. It was that water. It held the cure. So in answer to Jesus' question, he simply points out the problem. He said, I got nobody to get me in there. I'm, I'm thinking he's about to say, Jesus, can you help me? You know, how strong's your back? Has that become your problem as well, though? The only answer that you see to finding healing and help The only answer that you've found seems elusive and difficult and and almost even impossible. See, because like this man, you've limited God's ability to your ability. The only solution you can see, you think it's the only one that God can see. But what if Jesus said, I've got a different way for you. I've got a different path for you. What if he came along today and said, do you want to be made well? Can you believe that the answer might be found in something that you haven't seen yet? That Jesus didn't need the pool of Bethesda to heal this man? And he doesn't need what you think you need to be healed? Jesus wasn't limited by this man's narrow beliefs and understandings. (laughs) This man was certain that no healing could happen unless he understood how God could do it. And in his mind, the only way God could do it was to shove him in that water. In other words, he limited God's ability to his own abilities. If he couldn't figure it out, there just wasn't a solution. Now think about that for a minute. Isn't that so often how we approach our problems? We limit God to our understanding of things. 
We only trust God when we can look and say, okay, I can see how he can do it this way. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm trusting the Lord because I, I figured it out. But what if God's not going to work that way? What if God's got a whole different way that he's going to go about doing it? Can you trust him then? This guy was about to learn an important lesson of faith. He's about to see that God isn't limited the way he thought he was. God doesn't have just one way to solve any problem. And he certainly doesn't just have to do it the way you've got it figured out. Look at verse 8. Jesus said to him, Come, I'll help you in the water. No, that's not what it says. He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Now note the three commands of Jesus here. First, he says to him, rise. Jesus was asking this man to do something that he didn't think was possible. I think I hear in those words of Jesus, just try one more time. But I hear in the response of this man and in so many of our responses, I've tried. I've failed so many times. It's useless to try again. But Jesus is saying, hey, try one more time. But this time, try trusting me to help you. Together, we can accomplish what you haven't been able to do by yourself. I'm not saying just, Jesus isn't saying just try it again the way you've always tried it. Just try to break that habit the way you've always tried to break that habit. Just try to break that addiction the way you've always dealt with that addiction. No, I think Jesus is saying to this man, look, look at me. You and I together, we can do this. You can rise with my help. Yes, on your own, it's proven impossible. But together, we can do something that you haven't been able to do. Look at what he says next. He says, take up your bed. And now it's interesting. His bed had been the companion of his sickness all these years. I mean, it was, it was the single thing that he probably had with him the whole time. He had rested on it. He had found comfort in it all these years. By picking it up, he is declaring freedom from that bed. He's Declaring victory over that bed. He's saying, hey, I don't need you any longer to carry me. I'm going to carry you. Can you say that to that thing in your life? It's been holding you down, holding you back. Can you say to it, hey, I'm tired of me laying on you. No, I'm going to carry you. It's going to, I'm going to control you. You're not going to control me anymore. See, the bed was a symbol of his weakness. Now he's all about making the statement that I'm no longer going to be bound to this bed. I'm no longer going to be bound to this spot by this pool of water. He's saying, I'm no longer going to be bound to this community of sickness. No, he's going to be back among the healthy. He wants to be back among the well and the whole. And he's declaring for the first time in his life that his life will no longer be defined by this thing that has trapped him for so long. And then Jesus said, walk. Walking was the evidence of his healing. As we'll see later, his paralysis had probably been caused by some sin that he had committed or some habitual sin that he, admitted he had committed, and he had lost his ability to walk. So suddenly... If his ability to walk returns, it sends a message to him that forgiveness has come to his life, that restoration has taken place, that faith has sparked in his heart. His life had become whole again, and it was evidenced by his physical ability that had been restored. Now, please know this, and I want to make this really clear. Most sickness and disabilities are not a direct result of some sin that we've committed, okay? Do, do we all know that? We, we live in a sinful world where there are germs and there are diseases and people get sick and accidents happen to innocent families every single day. But there are times 
when our own sin leads directly to some kind of physical problem. We, our addictions, our sinful habits, they can wreak havoc on our body. But notice, there are also times when our spiritual healing brings along with it physical healing, instantly. Not always, but sometimes. I had a friend many, many years ago that I worked with who was just a major league drug addict. And uh, he got saved. And that afternoon, when he got saved and walked off that dock where he was sitting when the Lord touched his life, he never again touched another drug. God just took it away. Now, is that how it usually happens? No. Trust me, that is not how it usually happens. That's how it sometimes happens. That's how it happened to this man. By walking away from this place in this moment, he's walking away from his old life. With the help of Jesus, he wasn't going to be that same man again. The pool of Bethesda is going to be in his past. But we read, that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Now guys, the Sabbath day was a uniquely Jewish thing. God had required the nation to set aside one day in seven to rest and to worship. It was a day when you had to close the shop or the Chick-fil-A. It was a day when you had to leave the horse in the barn and let him take a nap. It was a day that if you had people working for him, they all got the day off. This idea was totally foreign to the surrounding nations. But God had commanded his people that this is the way you're going to live. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, we read these words. This is the Lord writing down. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your, nor the, your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Encoded in the law of Moses was this prohibition on working on the seventh day of the week. But what constitutes work? See, that was the question. And for hundreds of years, the religious leaders had spent time and time and time trying to define exactly what God meant by work. And they had come to some strange conclusions. But see, in doing so, they had turned a day that God intended to be a blessing into a day of turmoil and confusion for the people. The Jews had made list after list of things you could do and things you couldn't do. It had all turned the Sabbath day, a day of worship and celebration, into a day of imprisonment for the people. <laughs> See, the people got so distracted by trying to determine, oh, what's okay to do, what's not okay to do. They didn't have any time to rest. Their, their worship was discouraged. This story is a classic example of how misguided leaders, or how misguided the, the leaders and the people had become about the Sabbath day. See, I have no doubt that these guys knew this man. They recognized him. It wasn't like Jerusalem was a big city. It wasn't that big. And this guy had been there for 38 years. He was probably a pretty well-known beggar to them. And now, for the first time in 38 years, he's walking around. And yet, they totally missed the miracle. Isn't that amazing? All they see when they see this guy is, you're a lawbreaker, carrying your bed. See, they had decided that carrying your bed broke the Sabbath day. Now, God didn't decide that. They decided that. Now, if you want a working definition of what legalism is, I think we get it right here. Legalism is when you stop seeing the amazing grace of God all around you 
because you are blinded by your own requirements that everyone follow your mandated rules. In other words, you've lost sight of the good things that God is doing in your life because you're so consumed with, i got to follow this rule. i got to do this. i got to do that. I can't do that. Oh, i got to definitely stay away from that. And not only that, but you're looking around at all your friends and you're saying, you need to stop doing that. And you need to stop. And well, you can do that because I can do that. We can do that. But we can't do it. I mean, how many Christians do you know that that's how their life is lived? They are so worried about what they can and can't do. Their life has become nothing but following rules and trying to decide, is this okay or is that okay? Do you not think God can let you know what's okay and what's not okay? Can, can we just learn to rest in the grace and mercy of God and just say, Lord, if i got a problem in my life, let me know. Other than that, I'm just going with it. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to say that the Bible doesn't set limits on our behavior. Sure, it does. We all know that. And those aren't the things we worry about. But I am amazed at how people can get on tangents. Well, this is wrong. I think this is wrong. It may be wrong. I know somewhere, sometime in the past, somebody told me it was wrong. And, and, and what are you worried about it? God can let you know what's right and wrong. I love this man's answer to these guys. Verse 11, he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. I love what he tells these guys. He basically says this, hey, I'm just doing what the guy who did the miracle in my life told me to do. You got a problem with that? Now, let me ask you a question. If you had been unable to walk for 38 years and someone comes along and heals you, are you going to question what they ask you to do next? <laughs> you can best your last dollar. You're going to do exactly what they say to do. Okay, carry my bed. You got it, boss. I'm carrying my bed. Now, here's the pressing question. Did Jesus ask this man to break the Sabbath law? Absolutely not. Did he ask him to break their interpretation of the Sabbath day? Yes, he did. See, I think in this healing, Jesus is trying to kill two birds with one stone. First, he's proving his power over sin and sickness by healing this guy. But second, he's attacking these Jewish leaders for the confusion and muddled mess that they had made out of God's Sabbath day law. See, Jesus hated both. He hated what sin had done to mankind. He hated that the destructive power of sin can entrap us and had, and had ensnared this man's life. And he hated what these Jewish leaders had done to God's perfect law. They had complicated it. They had used it to enslave the people of God. Now, guys, let's not make the same mistake in following Jesus. Don't let your walk with Jesus become all about keeping a set of do's and don'ts. I've got to do this. I can't do that. Let me suggest to you, when I, try, when I just wake up every morning... And let the first thought that comes to your mind be this. Wow, God's mercies are new today. God is gracious today. He's given me another day. Okay, Lord, it's you and I. Don't you think God can let you know the things in your life that he wants to clean up? Absolutely. You don't have to go searching for them. I've found. I've found that when God's ready to deal with some of my life, he's hey, we're going to deal with this. Okay. Lord, I'm trusting your grace on this one, okay? It's not going to be easy. Stay focused on what matters. Stay focused on his mercies that are new every morning. Jesus had one more task to do before the day was done. Look at verse 14. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple, the man who had been healed, and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. 
Now, I love this. I love reading. Jesus went out and found this guy. You know, he's wandering around. You know, where is he? Where are you? I'm going to go find him. See, for Jesus, healing wasn't enough. Healing wasn't the end game here. Jesus healed the man in order to save the man. Guys, this is the way healing is always about. It's what it's always about in our lives. It, it, it is about drawing us closer to Jesus. This is why Jesus works in our heart. This is why he helps us get beyond things, because he's drawing us closer to be a better follower. When God does a miracle in your life, guys, don't miss the purpose of the miracle. Don't miss the purpose of the healing. It's so that you can grow closer to your Savior. That's why he does it. And this is why Jesus does every work, good work in our lives. But notice Jesus' closing message to this guy. He says, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Now, it's clear from these words that Jesus is connecting some sin or sinful habit that this guy had been involved with, with his paralysis. He's connecting those two things. And so he's telling him, as you're moving forward in your walk with God, don't go back there. Don't get caught up in sin again. He's not telling the guy you're going to live this perfect life, a sinless life. He's not saying that. He's trying to tell the guy, look, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin again. Just don't let that sin get another foothold in your life. See, it's one thing to commit a sin, but it's another thing to become a slave to that particular sin. When we do it over and over and over again, when we give into it. See, in the past, something had been a stronghold in this man's life, and he paid dearly for it. And Jesus is simply saying, hey, don't let it become a stronghold again. Don't go back there. Because the results of the stronghold had been sickness, disease. And Jesus was trying to save him from that. Now let me close with just a word of application from this study this morning. There are probably a few people here today that need physical healing. And maybe, we never know. God might want to do that. But I think there's far more people here that need more than physical healing. They need something in their life dealt with that's hurting them down deep inside. It's probably not a physical issue. It could be an emotional issue. It could be something going on in their mind, a thought life. See, physical wounds are easy to identify. They're easy to talk about. But you know, emotional wounds and scars run much deeper, much more difficult to deal with. Let me read you a quote from Dr. Mark Rutland's book, Courage to be Healed. There he says, You can be saved. You can be filled with the Spirit. You can love Jesus. You can read the Scriptures you can experience God's grace in a thousand areas of your life. It is still possible, though, with all this being true, that you might have some toxins in your soul ruining your life. Here is the all-important and yet oft-misunderstood truth. Salvation does what it does. It forgives us of our sins and puts us in a right relationship with an eternal God. It does not make us perfect. It does not heal all our hurts or all the unexplainable behaviors that we, are con that we are do that are contrary to what we believe. It does not necessarily make us whole. It may not resolve our every inner conflict. It may not heal our every twisted memory. But then he goes on and he says this. There are five great sicknesses that can live on in every believer who has been wounded by this sinful world. Shame, unforgiveness, rejection, condemnation, and fear. Can you relate to one of those? You felt those in your life before? I have a feeling there's a lot of people here today that have an open wound of one of these. And maybe this study's been just for you. See, you too have been laying on your blanket beside your pool of Bethesda. That lonely place where you hide out. 
Your life has been paralyzed by shame or by fear. Maybe you've been infected by the rejection of other people or even worse, their condemnation. Or maybe there's somebody in your past that you just simply cannot forgive. You hold on to that, forgive, that lack of forgiveness and, 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 and you, you grip it because you feel like if you let go of it, somehow you're going to justify what that person did to you. Or maybe you've been unable to forgive yourself. Even though you know God's forgiven you, well, that's okay, God, but I can't let go of this. Guys, those kind of things fester in our lives, down deep inside, and we hold on to them because we're comfortable with them. They've been a part of our life for so long, like that ugly, nasty blanket that that child holds on to. We hold on to it. And yet, God comes along and he says, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? And I think today Jesus is saying to some of you here today, rise up, take your bed and walk. In other words, try it again, but this time with my help. It's time to pick up that bed of bitterness that you've been lying on and carry it instead of letting it carry you. It's time to walk away from that lonely, cold place that you've been stuck in for so many years, all by yourself, all alone, not letting anybody know about it. And yet Jesus says, hey, grab my hand and let's walk away from here. And if that's you this morning, let me ask you that question one more time. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be healed? It could be today that you're the person that Jesus walks up to and says, hey, you, rise, take up your bed and walk. Let's pray together.